Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, ATS Industry Innovation Series. And uh, tonight's uh, topic is interstitial lung diseases, an overview of progression and radiological features. I'm um, uh, pleased to introduce my colleague, Jonathan Chung, Professor of Radiology, Vice Chair of Quality in the Department of Radiology and Section Chief Thoracic Radiology, University of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, I'm Greg Cosgrove. I'm a pulmonologist here at National Jewish in Denver, Colorado, and um, uh, delighted to be able to talk about um, interstitial lung disease and, and evolving concepts. And tonight's presentation is made on behalf of Bering Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. The company has provided financial support for the program, and the presentation content has been reviewed for consistency with FDA guidelines. So now we can jump into the presentation, and certainly um, an area that both um, Dr. Chung and I have been involved in is trying to understand interstitial lung disease and the diverse group of conditions that result in lung fibrosis. And um, overwhelmingly, we you can either um, look at the 200 different diseases that are comprised under that larger heading or begin to break it down into more manageable groups in terms of idiopathic diseases, hypersensitivity, autoimmune-associated interstitial lung diseases, sarcoidosis, and then a large group of um, uh, disorders that have entities unto themselves, like pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis X. But what, while they're unique entities and affect um, the lung and cause injury in different components, what we have come to realize over time is that um, of those groups, there's a large number of them in which fibrosis occurs, and in certain groups, there is progressing of that fibrosis, which has significant clinical ramifications um, and helps us to understand perhaps the commonalities between diseases and ways in which we can um, uh, treat them uh, moving forward. And so certainly uh, with all fibrotic diseases, whether it's in the lung in the heart, the liver, the presence of fibrosis actually has a significant um, impact upon survival or is um, a, a marker of, of mortality uh, or higher degree of mortality. So it's an important feature that I think we've come to realize and can now map better, whether it be through physiologic and or radiographic features. And so that will be the focus of our discussion tonight is those with progressive fibrotic lung disease. Um, but if we take a step back, and, and this is a really um, nice cartoon that, that really describes perhaps what we experience when um, the lung is injured in normalcy, that there's wound healing and restoration of function, which hopefully occurs in the vast majority of us, whether we have pneumonia or um, aspiration, that there's um, appropriate wound healing. And the model, well, is not well delineated, but we conceptualize that in patients who have interstitial lung disease and go on to develop fibrosis, that there's an abnormal wound healing process. And that is a huge statement because the, the process of wound healing is complex to say the least, but suffice it to say there's not restoration of normal function and there is damage that persists and in some cases progresses over time. And the resultant um, manifestations of that injury is that there's compromise of gas exchange and lung function, which can be manifest in many different ways, depending on the areas in which the lung is damaged. But certainly in the interstitial lung disease field and some of the more prototypical diseases, it manifests not only with shortness of breath, but with cough and, and unfortunately progressive hypoxia, which is the hallmarks of the disease. So it, it affects many individuals in different ways, but the commonality is progressive breathlessness. Um, what I've spent, and, and I think many of us on this call, is how do we appropriately identify patients with um, features of pulmonary fibrosis? How do we identify them early? How do we implement uh, features of supportive measures and then diagnose them? And, uh, and that is a challenging process, and there's a diagnostic delay which can range between six months or two to three years with significant um, quote unquote, misdiagnosis, but I would argue that in, in individuals impacted, oftentimes the differential is quite complex, and so common things being common, they have to be excluded first, but 
Uh, what we do see in many individuals with interstitial lung disease is a triad of symptoms that are important to recognize and should be considered with um, dyspnea, which is most often breathlessness with activity. Oftentimes, there's a progressive cough or the presence of a non-productive cough. And importantly, if you ask and probe, there are um, cues that might raise your suspicion for interstitial lung disease, such as a family history or um, uh, environmental exposures that, that would put patients at risk. And to complement that abnormal exam findings, which are oftentimes later in development, so we prefer to identify patients before they develop um, significant uh, chest imaging abnormalities. And um, unfortunately, crackles is more of a late manifestation in, in a, a large majority of patients, as is exertional desaturation. But um, I would say that that can be a, a, an important sign to pick up early rather than when patients are desaturating at rest, and that really suggests more significant lung damage. And uh, moving forward, certainly uh, when physiology is done, the hallmarks of um, uh, spirometric abnormalities with a low um, FVC and or lung volumes as well as decreased DLCO really raise the concern for an interstitial lung disease and we should move forward to appropriately evaluate patients. And in other forums, and, and uh, we certainly have discussed the challenges with making the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. So that's not as much the focus for tonight, but suffice it to say, regardless if it's uh, um, evaluating someone for lung cancer or for a complex disease such as interstitial lung disease, the more people you have rendering opinion and bringing expertise to bear to a conversation, the more likely maybe a consensus diagnosis can be made. And there's a suggestion that that consensus diagnosis allows for a more efficient and more accurate diagnosis. And in the interstitial lung disease field, we use the term multidisciplinary diagnosis team, which if you're fortunate enough and you have all these individuals at the same institution, as occurs perhaps fortunate here at National Jewish or at University of Chicago, where a pulmonologist, a radiologist, a pathologist, rheumatologist, the um, physician extenders, which can be uh, nurse practitioners and sometimes the primary care physicians participate in this meeting since they know the patients the best, as well as respiratory therapists, bringing to bear all those experiences um, that can help us make the diagnosis as rapidly as possible. And as Jonathan would say, that doesn't mean they're all in the same room. A lot of times we'll communicate with um, you know, social media or uh, which is appropriate HIPAA compliant technology so that individuals can communicate in a very busy environment, but um, we can render opinions and work together. Um, if you're fortunate enough to be in the same room, then I think that's a, a really great, unique experience. But that does not fit into the workflow of many institutions. Um, and so uh, I'll just argue that um, communication is very important for complex diseases, and it's the hallmark of what we do in interstitial lung disease and the, uh, to help patients the most. And, and so what I would argue is um, as we're thinking about progressive pulmonary fibrosis uh, or chronic fibrosing interstitial lung disease, it's not a static environment. We need to have serial data to understand perhaps what was happening six months ago or three months ago and compare it to what's happening now, whether that be physiology, um, symptoms, radiographic abnormality, um, as well as quality of life and, and assessing the, the different arenas in which the disease can impact individuals. And so pulling all that together can help us understand um, the status of a disease. And then the hardest part is distinguishing progression. Is it related to the interstitial lung disease or do they have comorbid diseases that can further um, complicate and, and worsen symptoms? And so that's the challenge that we have, but I think we have unique tools moving forward that um, we can begin to determine whether it's the interstitial lung disease responsible for progressive symptoms or it's other aspects of a patient's health. And so um, I think that's the, the next step that Dr. Chung would address and the unique ability of um, high-resolution CT scans in helping us with patients who have ILD. So, Jonathan, welcome. Uh, well, it's great to be here. I'm very excited. Uh, before I talk about HRCT scans and, and how you approach an HRCT scan, I did want to echo what Dr. Cosgrove was saying. Um, temporally discordant communication as MDD 
I think it's going to become more and more common. Everyone's very busy, and there's nothing wrong with doing temporarily discorded MDD. And, you know, that's just a fancy way of saying using email, HIPAA compliant email, HIPAA compliant texting to communicate with the other people who are part of the team, the rheumatologist, pathologist, pulmonologist, and obviously radiologist as well. Um, that's it's really useful. I mean, I, I think that you know, in business they say, what do they say? Um, you know, a a good plan today is better than a a great plan tomorrow. I think it's different in ILD. Again, it's a chronic lung disease, so you can wait to make the the diagnosis. You know, the the right diagnosis tomorrow is better than the you know a okay diagnosis today, right? So using temporally discordant information and communication is really really essential, and one should not eschew that. All right. Anyways, let's go get back to HRCT. So. <laughs> Before we start talking about what ILD looks like on HRCT, you kind of have to know what the HRCT is, right? High resolution chest CT. And so, high resolution chest CT, how is it different from regular chest CT? There's a lot of data there, there's a lot of things to look at, but you know, I can I can narrow it down to really four things. So, an HRCT as opposed to a regular chest CT, you reconstruct the images very thinly, right? So around one millimeter, so very very thin, you know, slicing through the body like this. And the reason why we do that is because we want the best in-plane axial resolution. And so the way to do that is get the thinnest cuts possible, around one millimeter. We actually go sub-millimeter. I think in National Jewish, they go around one millimeter, if not sub-millimeter as well. Um, it's pretty standard. That's just the way to go. So that's probably the most important part of what an HRCT is relative to a regular chest CT. Regular chest CT, uh, now the standard is about three millimeters, two and a half millimeters, depending on the type of CT scan you have. But HRCT, you really need those one millimeter cuts. Also with HRCT, we don't Get intravenous contrast because we don't need it. Anytime you give someone something in their body, you risk they're going to have some sort of adverse reaction. Also, Curis would say that if you give intravenous contrast, you actually might limit the evaluation for subtle abnormality within lungs. This is a little bit more contentious, and it depends on whether you're a purist or not. Uh, and National Jewish, which is like the purest of the pure places, and I used to work there, so I know, um, if someone was given intravenous contrast, we would actually rescan that patient without the intravenous contrast to get the right answer. Because National Jewish is a very unique place, as you know, because um, it's a tertiary quaternary center, so people are going there oftentimes to get the answer when there's some disagreement. So uh, there's no room for any sort of like, you know, wishy-washy, uh, assessment on CT. You need to get the answer. And so for there, in, in that setting, if you gave intravenous contrast and we were worried about ILD, we would rescan the patient without intravenous contrast. A lot of other places, if intravenous contrast was uh, was um, given, as long as thin reconstructions were performed, it would be okay and they would move forward. Okay. But typically in HRCT, we don't give intravenous contrast. That's number two. Uh, number three, in addition to in, uh, imaging the patient when they're supine and in inspiration, we also image the patient in expiration as well. And that can be in the supine or prone position, but typically it's in the supine position because patients have a hard time holding their breath in the prone position. And the only reason we do that is to really look for one thing and one thing only, significant air traffic, because that draws you away from a diagnosis of UIP or you know, usual interstitial pneumonia. Uh, which, as you guys know, is the imaging and histological correlate of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and more to an alternative diagnostic category, okay? Only reason we do that it really is, is for that, to look for significant air trapping. And what are we thinking about? Usually it's going to be hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Sometimes you can also actually see it in connective tissue disease as well as sarcoidosis as well. But really, it's going to be usually HP when we think about the sort of the classic fibrotic interstitial lung diseases. So that's number three, expiratory imaging. And number four, what differences in HRCT from regular chest CT? We do prone imaging. So prone imaging and inspiration. So when you're lying on your back, so you know, if, you're, if you've got a patient lying on their back like this, along the posterior aspect of their lungs, you're going to you can get a little bit of atelectasis because the lungs, even though they're mostly gas-filled, they do have some weight in there. There's blood in there. There's connective tissue in there. So the posterior aspect of the lungs can get a little atelectatic. So to open those areas up to make sure there's no subtle fibrosis, we flip the patient over onto the belly and rescan, usually through the lower aspect of the thorax to save on some radiation dose. And really, those are the four things that different differentiates an HRCT from a regular chest CT. So once you have an HRCT and you have someone with obvious interstitial lung disease, how do you approach it? It can be very complex. You know, there's up to a thousand, sometimes over a thousand images that you can look at on an HRCT image if you include the chrono and sagittal reformations as well as the expiratory images. So how do you approach it? Well, I think the most tried and true methodology is to first think about what features are present. So for example, is there uh, reticulation, honeycombing, traction bronchitis, all this lexicon of findings of frank pulmonary fibrosis. And are there other things like ground glass opacity, consolidation, 
ear traffic, which is again is very important. We see on the expiratory imaging. Um, you know, what are the what are the stars of the show in terms of those CT features? So you get that, you kind of put it aside, and you know what the major pattern is on that HRCT, and then you think about the distribution. I and mean, there's really two distributions you talk about on on CT: up and down, superior inferior. So superior inferior um, distribution, like, and we're talking about the major distribution. You can have obviously a little bit of basal stuff if most of the fibrosis can be superior. Then you would call that a superior predominant distribution of fibrosis. So again, in the superior inferior direction, and as well as in the axial plane of the CT scan. So is it peripheral? Is it central? Is it diffuse? That kind of thing. So once you got all those things together, you you got the pattern of abnormality on HRC. You got on a good HRCT. And then you know the distributions, both up and down, superior and inferior, and then within the plane of the axial CT scan, now you're ready to go, right? Now you're ready to subcategorize. And so, let's, before we talk about subcategories, let's show you examples of fibrosis, the, 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 the patterns that I was talking about just now. So, reticulation, traction bronchitis, and honeycombing are in that order, more severe phenotypes of pulmonary fibrosis that we see on CT and HRCT. So reticulation really just means these tiny little lines superimposed on each other, and it's the earliest finding of pulmonary fibrosis that we see. Now the next level up is traction bronchiectasis, and so when you say when we say traction bronchiectasis, we literally mean bronchiectasis due to fibrosis. The fibrosis is chronically tugging on those airways and causing irreversible airway dilation. So that's the next level of severity of pulmonary fibrosis. And then really end stage pulmonary fibrosis is on this right hand image here where we see honeycomb cysts, and so. When do we, we call honeycomb cysts? When we see these fibrotic subtural cysts, which are either lining up in rows or stacking upon each other. There's a beautiful example here on the right. We see all these subtural cysts, which are stacking upon each other, classic honeycombing. One of the most specific findings of usual interstitial pneumonia that we see on HRCT. Once you have your major pattern of pulmonary fibrosis or just pattern on your HRCT and your distributions, how do you subcategorize them? And so, we have a UIP classification system that's supported by um, multiple pulmonary societies. There's also uh, maybe a competing one uh, supported by Fleischner Society, but they're almost exactly the same. But for now, because of the audience and because this is uh, you know ATS, we will obviously use the ATS multi-society uh, guidelines here. So the, the first pattern that we talk about, and probably the most important pattern, is that UIP pattern. And so this UIP pattern for, for as a radiologist is very important. This is where I add the most value to you guys as, as clinicians. So if I say something is UIP on HRCT, take it to the bank, you know? It's gonna be UIP in pathology. And that's why we've obviated biopsy in that setting. You don't have to biopsy these patients with UIP because over 95% of the time, they're gonna have UIP in pathology. And so what does UIP look like on HRCT? You gotta have all these findings. Peripheral, basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis, characterized by reticulation, and a pleural honeycomb. You can have traction bronchiectasis or not. That doesn't actually sway you one way or another, but you gotta have that subpleural honeycombing and the peripheral and basal distribution. Um, so, on occasion, you know, I'm, I'm taking, using a little liberty here. On occasion, the, in the zonal distribution, it can be diffuse, but in most cases, it can be basal or predominant. So, when you have all those things, and, and probably the most important thing, no other findings suggest an alternative diagnosis, you can just call this UIP and HRCT, and the patient has UIP. You do not need to uh, pursue surgical lung biopsy in these patients. The next UIP category is probably UIP. And the nice thing about probably UIP, and I'm taking some liberties here, uh, but for, for the most part, um, this is true. If you know what UIP is, you know what probably UIP is on HRCT, because more or less they're exactly the same, except with probably UIP, there is no subpleural honeycombing. And again, there's that caveat, no findings that suggest an alternative diagnostic category. So nothing that, no, no significant air trapping, not a lot of consolidation, no micronodular lung, lung disease, nothing like that. It's got to be really a fibrotic pattern. So again, the only thing that differentiates UIP from probably UIP is the absence of subpleural honeycombing. I will say probably UIP also has a high likelihood of being UIP in pathology, depending on uh, what study you read. It's going to be 80 to 90 percent, and the older you are, uh, the more likelihood that's going to be UIP. And that's why if you if you read Fleischer Society and if you read multi -society, the multi society guidelines very carefully, and then the editorials that go with it as well as talk to some ILD experts, most people will agree that if you have a probable UIP pattern in someone um, who has a high pretest probability, high CT pretest probability of having IPF, you've essentially made the diagnosis. So a lot of these patients with probable UIP who are older, you probably don't need to pursue surgical lung biopsy. Um, I'm sure there is a subset of patients with probable UIP who might still require biopsy. For example, you, know, you got a 40-year-old woman come in with a probable UIP pattern. That's not going to be IPF, right? That's that's a patient where you, you, you have to consider surgical lung biopsy, at least on some level. But if you had someone who's 85 years old, 
I think that's low. 80 year old man coming in, you know, former smoker. Uh, no other, no, no other findings that suggest, you know, like connective tissue disease or, or hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and they have a probable UIV pattern. You probably made the diagnosis. So that's the next category. Uh, the the next category after that is the indeterminate for UIP category. I actually love this category because uh, in the previous iteration of the gui these guidelines, there was no place for hard cases. Now, finally, there's a place for hard cases. And look at the literature, anywhere from, you know, one out of 10 to one out of eight cases, I think it's probably more like one out of eight cases on HRCT are going to be hard. And this, this is from academic centers, right? So a lot of people know that at academic centers, um, we see probably harder cases because a lot of the easier, more straightforward cases at this point probably have been picked off in the community, right? If it's straightforward, if it's classic, it's, it's the community physicians are very good at, at diagnosing those as are community radiologists. But some of the more complex ones, uh, they might eventually trickle down to tertiary or quaternary centers. So again, the one out of eight, take that with a little bit of grain of salt. But bottom line, there's a significant minority of patients who get HRCTs in which a radiologist, chest radiologist who really likes ILD, has a hard time figuring out what the pattern is. And now we have that. It's the, essentially the indeterminate for UIP pattern. And sometimes you get these mild cases of pulmonary fibrosis where you're not quite sure. Again, now we have this bin to put those into. And the last subcategory is this of the alternative diagnostic category. These are essentially findings that really don't jive with UIP, right? So uh, either distribution isn't right, it's upper lung or mid lung proponent, or it, instead of being peripheral, it's central lung proponent, or there are these findings that really don't jive with fibrosis. It's uh, you know, we, we're, we're seeing uh, diffuse cystic lung disease or not diffuse nodular lung disease or frank areas of diffuse ground glass opacic consolidation. Those don't really jive with UIP. That would make us invoke the alternative diagnostic category. All right, I just, uh, just, just a reminder that you can use CT to follow patients longitudinally. Uh, a lot of places don't do this, right? I mean, uh, you know, I think the standard way is to kind of do, to work these up patients clinically and obviously assess their function and see how they're doing. Um, sometimes, though, if someone's uncooperative or they can't give you a good PFT, maybe you can use CT to follow these patients. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, over the course of years, the, the increase in severity of fibrosis is pretty marked, as shown here. All right, so how does one diagnose idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? You know, I, I, I hate to I hate to pontificate at you guys uh, because I'm not a clinician, I'm a radiologist, right? But the first and most important step is up to you guys. It's, it's really detailed history and physical, trying to find a cause for interstitial lung disease. And then after that, it's HRCT, right? It's HRCT, and if, you, if there's no known cause for interstitial lung disease and you have a UIP pattern, and sometimes a probable UIP pattern, again, with a very high pretest probability of IPF, you've essentially made the diagnosis of IPF. Now, if you don't have a high, pre, high competence UIP pattern on CT, then you consider surgical lung biopsy, BAL, and then you kind of um, come together as, in the MDD and figure out what the best diagnosis is for that patient. Greg, did you want to comment on that anymore? Like I, again, I feel almost guilty of talking about this, given that you're an expert on this um, uh, clinically. No, as always, I just defer to the radiologist, Jonathan. <laughs> 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 no, but I think it speaks to the, the team nature of things, that the segregation between radiologist and pulmonologist and, and even pathologist. Um, I, I think it's the, the excellent team approach that um, uh, our radiologists are, are now being exposed to a lot of the clinical features, and, and I would hope, um, vice versa, that we're learning from each other, and, and um, I learn um, from our radiologist and, and interpret CT imaging better. And I think when you hear the clinical story, um, it informs you maybe to subtle findings and, and guide things. Um, I think it's a great learning opportunity if, if we uh, pay attention to our colleagues. And so I, I think it's great that you um, are, are learning more about the clinical aspects rather than being sequestered away with just the images. That, that's the way medicine should be. So that would be my comment. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's amazing how um, having a little clinical input, like when like it's kind of knowing what someone is thinking, like my pulmonologist, my rheumatologist, how it can sway you one way or another. Like obviously, like there's some they're classic cases, right? They're sort of like you know cut and dry cases, but a lot of these cases are sort of in the middle, like on that fence, like one way or another. And it's a, it's amazing how a little bit of information can kind of sway you one way or the other, where you can kind of see those subtle findings and say, oh, okay, this is a diagnosis of HP, or or yeah, yeah, you know what, you know, you think about connectivity, yeah, that pattern does kind of feel like a connectivity. So um, it, it helps to prime the brain. And I would um, argue when you speak to your pathologist, uh, he or she, if they have more information, um, not just uh, shortness of breath, which is typically what they get, 
it helps them understand mm-hmm. maybe the, the same thing, the path, subtle pathologic abnormalities moving forward. So again, how do we do that in a busy environment? Well, um, with, uh, I like your phrase, the, um, the synchronous temporal communication or whatever you had said before. In other words, we just have to figure out how it works in each and everyone's workflow. Yep, for sure. Um, so, so maybe we'll jump to a case. We've set some of the background, and, and this is what I think is is um, the exciting part of what we do in diagnosing individuals. Um, but this is a, a fairly straightforward presentation of someone with a lot of um, comorbidities. We see reflux, prior smoker, but not significant. We do see physiologic abnormalities with features of restriction, um, with the sper- spirometric abnormalities and, and significant um, uh, difference in DLCO. And appropriately, screening serologies as well as clinical exam did not support a diagnosis or suggest a diagnosis of an underlying rheumatologic process. And we see that in this um, individual, they were uh, a common age to identify pulmonary fibrosis, 67 years, and the exam findings were fairly um, suggestive with mid to late inspiratory crackles. And there was also digital clubbing, and importantly, there weren't other features of comorbidities, perhaps um, assessing for pulmonary hypertension with cardiovascular changes and or any physical exam findings to to suggest an underlying autoimmune disease. Um, And then we have a a radiographic image. Jonathan, if you want to describe that. Yeah, I mean, so uh, I had to look at it a little more carefully. it is a UIP pattern of pulmonary fibrosis. I think there is some probable mild subpleural honeycombing in the right lower lobe, but this is this is real life. You know, these sort of cases where you got to squint, you got to like, you know, kind of take off your glass a little bit or you know, adjust your glasses, look a little more closely in window. Um, that's a real life case, but clearly a very coarse reticulation with contraction bronchiectasis and subpleural honeycombing. So this is a UIP pattern. So would support a diagnosis of IPF. I think these are maybe the the situation where, unfortunately, the diagnosis seems quite apparent. You would, um, I welcome it when we have to struggle because perhaps that means there's an alternative diagnosis, or it might. What I hope to happen in the future is we identify patients earlier where the radiographic changes um, prohibit you from saying um, either a UI, a typical UIP or a probable, but we're catching patients earlier. So the diagnosis is in question. I think that would be a good problem because that means we're identifying patients earlier and perhaps um, one hypothesis is that maybe therapies could be more effective, but we don't know that um, uh, for truth right now. But in most diseases, the earlier you catch them, the greater impact you can make on a patient's life. And so that, that would be the hope with through raising awareness. Um, and and the reason I think it's so challenging and, and perhaps why um, identifying patients, and it speaks to the knowledge gap that we don't have, but um, as you had suggested, Jonathan, perhaps the role of um, interpreting images long, longitudinally is, can we identify patients and understand their clinical course? And I think this is the hardest conversation one I had four times today is, how do you tell patients when you diagnose them with IPF? on which clinical course will they be? Will they be one of those fortunate and rare patients that have a stable course, or will they have a rapid acceleration? And and the current status is we don't have a a biomarker, or it would be wonderful to have a PSA for IPF where we could understand the natural history of their disease or predict which course. So it leads us to a lot of um, serial evaluations, which is good because we can address multiple comorbidities at different time points, but it is one of the hardest clinical discussions to have. And, and is a patient going to have, um, let's see if I can get the point in work, um, are they going to have an acute exacerbation, which, you know, in today's environment, we might think is COVID-19, but not all deteriorations are COVID-19 related. We know that depending on the season, upwards of maybe 4 to 11% of patients will have rapid deterioration um, with hypoxemia and as well as physiologic changes in diffuse ground glass, which oftentimes is missed on screening chest X-ray in the office. But if you actually pursue it and, and, and you have someone with progressive symptoms, a CT scan can be quite helpful. The reason that has significant um, 
uh, implications in terms of, of survival. And, and just the presence of an acute exacerbation really changes the way in which uh, patients perceive their lives and, and how we have to treat them. So, um, you know, this is a step forward that if we can, through further research, identify these different courses and be able to predict better, that, that is, I think, a, a major emphasis throughout our community, and it's through the radiographic uh, assessment with quantitative imaging, as well as um, peripheral biomarkers, uh, genomic biomarkers. So it, it's um, a lot of emphasis. We need a lot of work to be done, but hopefully over the next several years, we can we can use information and, and better predict for our patients, which right now we're, we're quite limited. Um, and, and Jonathan, I might have spoken a little bit out of turn, but you can um, uh, really delineate some of the features that we see radiographically um, with this quite uh, troublesome course in those with acute exacerbations. Oh, no, I mean, I mean you, you hit it out of the ballpark. I mean, a, a case like this, if you were to just evaluate this patient with a radiograph, a PA radiograph, um, there's probably going to be some subtle abnormality compared to baseline. So, um, you know, may, maybe maybe on a good day, a, a good radiologist might be able to see that, or a pulmonologist might see that and say, oh, there's a little bit too much, um, you know, dirtiness in the lungs, right? Maybe the vessels seem a little fuzzy. But a lot of this ground glass opacity that we're seeing in this patient five months later during their acute exacerbation, it would be almost invisible on a, on a chest radiograph, just given the fact that you're getting someone who's 3D and you're kind of smashing them into a, a 2D image, right? 3D into 2D, right? So you lose that contrast resolution. As opposed to CT, I mean, this slaps you in the face, right? There's obviously more ground glass opacity all throughout the lung. So I made this as a lesson. The lesson is if you, you're scared someone has some sort of acute exacerbation or, or clinically someone has worsening with someone with pulmonary fibrosis, you can't stop at a radiograph. You need to get the CT scan. Um, I learned from many mistakes and, and not doing that. And then Jonathan reminded me on several patients, maybe we should get a CT scan. Um, okay. and, and oftentimes you're worried about uh, pulmonary emboli. And so we, we might do a CTA and, and then we pick up on, on that. So I think that that was the informative um, process that we learned in uh, moving forward. Um, so we'll move to the next slide. So maybe discuss a, another important disease that uh, I'll be honest, there are new guidelines that came out in August from the ATS about diagnosing patients with hypersensitivity. It is um, almost like pulmonary emboli. You think about it a lot. You miss it more often than you think, and you, you know it when you see it, but oftentimes you miss it. And so it's it's challenging, and it speaks to the diversity of the immune system and uh, another area of emphasis, and we'll talk about that reason why, but, um, you know, the inhaled antigens and, and you can think about it from any form of any aspect of one's life, whether it's environmental, occupational, or avocational. So anything in which you're breathing in an immune response, not really an allergic response, but an immune response where there's damage and it typically involves the um, alveoli, but as well, in contrast to IPF, there's a more focused involvement of the bronchioles and um, and abnormalities that, that we'll discuss on the CT scan. But it appears that in certain patients, uh, there is a progressive nature, and it's almost like a tipping point where they have acute HP, or you know, at least that's how we used to define it, where they, they can resolve if the exposure is removed. But at some point, there's a tipping point, and Naftali Kaminsky suggested there's a, a genomic signature to this, that they go from non-fibrotic to fibrotic. And, and so perhaps a switch is thrown, and then independent of the exposure, they have progressive pulmonary fibrosis. And so it, it speaks to me that um, we really need to better understand this because the prevalence is probably underestimated. But it is the one disease that I would argue if we catch early, and Jonathan, correct me, but I say we can cure this. And I'll stand by that if, if we identify the exposure and we remove it from that person's environment, they, they will have lung injury but we can prevent it from progressing. So I think this is the you know, holy grail of ILD in that through a history, you can make a diagnosis and you can really um, dramatically impact patients moving forward. But um, that being said, it, it's, it's a challenge every single day. Do um, you have any comments, Jonathan? Because you, you see it radiographically a lot. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. No, it's just... It's just... Uh, just kind of rung a bell in my brain where I was like, yeah, I mean, if you if you can catch these patients with non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you really, you can eradicate this, right? Um, and, 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 you know, I think that in the future, 
we're going to be leveraging things, and I, I know this is a little bit off topic, but our, I get, leveraging tools like artificial intelligence, you know, natural language processing of reports to kind of identify these patients who are underdiagnosed, right? So they, so they have some sort of chronic lung thing. No one really knows what they have, but like, that's not an acute event, right? Maybe the patient came in with a pneumonia and they're, they're treating the pneumonia and then the patient has sort of lost the follow-up. Uh, no one worries about the chronic sort of lung abnormality and kind of dirtiness in the lungs, but that's like early hypersensitive pneumonitis. What if we catch those early before the fibrosis started, right? Um, and then we can, we can remove the patient from their exposure. And again, like you're, as you're saying, we can just get rid of it. Ah, that would be a beautiful thing, wouldn't it? There is work maybe to make your lives easier to the history. It is cumbersome, and it takes a lot of time, which not a lot of you have on a regular basis. But um, there are some efforts by people like Murdu Galati at Yale and, and Becky Boscom to um, develop a, a standardized questionnaire so that patients can do that before they hit the office. And maybe you can pick up these patients. Um, you know, For me, I ask everyone if they have had any bird exposures at home, at work, or at any point in their life, because um, uh, that's what I find as a common HP in my practice. But um, so those tools, you know, they're they're being evolved, uh, developed, and, and there are, there's a lot of emphasis at the ATS as well as at the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation to make your lives easier and hopefully we catch these patients. Um, the diagnostic approach. Um, I'll speak to to some of the uh, testing and leave the HRCT for Jonathan, but um, there's controversy whether or not the, the role for serum antibody testing against suspected antigen. I'd say it's it's challenging because the sensitivity and the specificity is quite limited. Um, and so, it, at least in my practice, that's not a, a, a common feature of the diagnostic strategy. I think the HRCT and um, if necessary, uh, bronchoscopy with and without uh, a lung biopsy are really the, the hallmarks. And importantly, that is, um, those are only to complement the, the clinical history and, the, and the, the concern. But that being said, we we suggest that perhaps in 30% of the time when Jonathan is concerned about HP on the HRCT, we have no clinically relevant exposure. So it's um, it's a, a knowledge gap that we need to fill in future. So we just might either we're not asking the right questions or um, we haven't identified the expo all the exposures that are important to develop the lung abnormalities. Um, so it really is a, a, a comprehensive approach and it it's the discussion that I have with Jonathan about the HRCT abnormalities and a back and forth. And, and I would say, don't be afraid to go back after, uh, if I miss something and then the imaging suggests that, uh, that HP is a possible diagnosis, my next step is to call the patient up and go back and redo the history. And oftentimes they'll, they'll um, bring up something that, that wasn't really thought important before, but you might change your mind. Um, so I'm sorry, Jonathan. Do uh, you have comments on this slide just about the HRT features? No, no. Okay. We, can, we can jump. Actually, like the next slide actually is about HRCT of uh, HP. Okay. Pattern. Okay. Good. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, so as as Greg was alluding to, uh, the previous iteration, I guess there wasn't really like a HP guideline, but uh, but the previous uh, categorization of HP was really based on temporality, so acute, subacute, chronic. The new guidelines for HP, and again, I strongly encourage you to read that because in the time allotted, we can't go through, through it in enough detail. But bottom line, it's, it, that sort of has been um, kind of pushed aside. And now really it's about identifying non-fibrotic HP and fibrotic HP, uh, whether it's on imaging or pathology. But a lot of these cases, as you know, that's going to be based on imaging, which makes imaging you know, more important in the setting of HP because based on, based on that, you're actually gonna, are gonna go through a different workflow, different diagnostic workflow um, in terms of trying to diagnose these patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis or with something else. And so with both a non-fibrotic and fibrotic pattern, you have these subcategories. So if you think someone has non-fibrotic disease um, you, you tr and you're thinking about HP, you, your choices are um, typical HP pattern on CT, compatible with HP pattern on CT, and indeterminate for HP on CT. And so again, we can't go into all the details here, but bottom line is a high confidence HP pattern, so this typical HP pattern um, in a non-fibrotic patient on HRCT, you're really looking for two things, a conglomeration of small airway disease, usually air trapping or mosaic attenuation or um, the head cheese sign, or now they you know, call it the you know, three density sign, Right, so but essentially the the old school head cheese sign, 
combined with an infiltrative abnormality. So that's going to be ground glass opacity within the lung. And the distribution in these cases is very often diffuse, and that's the highest confidence pattern that we have. Let me show you some examples here. So here we see a lot of ground glass opacity throughout the lungs. As you guys know, we, we call white stuff in the lungs on CT ground glass opacity when it's clearly white, clearly dense, but you can still see underneath it. You can still see the underlying pulmonary vessel. So ground glass opacity in the lungs, it's, it's one of the most common findings of non-fibrotic HP that we see. And then that combined with significant air trapping, as shown here on the, in the bottom hand image here, so there's an abnormal patient on inspiration expiration. Uh, if you see a large degree of air trapping, as we see here, combined with ground glass opacity, and sometimes the ground glass opacity is, is less florid than the air trapping, especially if that distribution is diffuse, that's a high confidence non fibrotic HP pattern. Okay, um, this is a nice example actually of why we do expiratory imaging. So, uh, we have expiratory imaging here on the right column, inspiratory imaging here on the left column. On both of these left-hand column images, they look relatively normal. Uh, this abnormal case down here on the bottom left, there, there is ground glass, you know, diffuse ground glass, a little bit of granular ground glass as well. But if you're looking at it quickly, I think that it'd be hard for you guys to see that mosaic attenuation. But that's what we do with expiratory imaging. On the expiratory imaging, we see these florid areas of secondary lobular air trapping. And so that would, again, draw you away from a diagnosis of UIP. Uh, certainly not probable UIP, and more toward this alternative diagnostic category, uh, and, and in this case, likely hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Another example of non-fibrotic HP here, again, we see this conglomeration of con ground glass opacity as well as mosaic attenuation air trapping. And again, in the diffuse distribution, really, really high confidence to be HP. And that's when you have to dig a little bit deeper to look for different causes of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. I mean, very often it's going to be birds. In Chicago, it's, uh, it's birds very often, but we obviously have like a lot of older buildings as well, especially our schools. For some reason, a lot of our public schools are pretty old and uh, musty, and so mold is another thing that we we commonly think about. And then when I, when I used to work in Colorado, um, a common question would always be hot, uh, hot tubs, indoor hot tubs, probably because, you know, the ski sort of, ski board sort of culture there, right? You know, what do you do after you have a hard day of skiing or snowboarding? You sit in the hot tub, right? With you know, the water like this high above your nose, right? <laughs> Just <laughs> kind of like your, your muscles relax. And certainly that's uh, another cause of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Uh, fibrotic HP, again, I strongly encourage you to read the guidelines. We can't go through all this. But bottom line, a high confidence fibrotic HP pattern on CT, what are you looking for? Obviously, looking for fibrosis. I mean, that's why it's in the fibrotic pattern. But the distribution here is very important. So the distribution is going to be either diffuse or it's going to be mid-lung preponderant or it's going to give you relative basal or sparing. Um, so I, I think that upper lung preponderance should actually be in this category as well. But actually, if you read carefully, it's actually part of the compatible with the HP pattern. But bottom line is, for me, basal or sparing means upper lung preponderance, right? And take it whatever way you will. But if you read the literature carefully, upper lung preponderance, very uncommon in UIP, very uncommon in um, certainly very, very uncommon NSIP, which leaves you with HP. So I certainly think that a high confidence pattern should involve the upper lung preponderance. Um, and so whatever you want, you want to deal with that, it's fine. Right, uh, but in addition to that, the distribution you want to have superimposed small airway disease. So what are we looking for here? Again, we're looking for air trapping, mosaic attenuation, the three density sign, um, also known as the formerly known as the head chi sign. So those things in conglomeration, in combination, should make one strongly consider fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And so, unfortunately, when these patients develop pulmonary fibrosis, very often their fibrosis starts to uh, mimic UIP and sometimes NSIP. So these patients, it's actually easier for me as a radiologist to diagnose them when they have non-fibrotic disease as opposed to fibrotic disease. And the way I you know, think of it is this, it's like fibrosis is essentially, um, it's, it's the, the body's reaction to some sort of you know, abnormal stimulus, right? And so a lot of different things can cause end-stage pulmonary fibrosis, whether it's due to hypersensitivity pneumonitis, IPF or connective tissue disease. And as it becomes more and more severe, they start to actually kind of like meld into each other and look like each other. It's, it's like if you go to like a, a scrapyard and you see these cars that are all, all like squeezed together, you know, they're sort of crushed so that they could be stacked together. Very, uh, very difficult to figure out what those cars used to be, as opposed to if you go a year ago, two years ago, before they were all crushed together, and you look at that car, then it's much easier to figure out that, oh, this was a Nissan, that was a Toyota, this was, you know, this was a you know, Mercedes, right, that kind of thing, right? So it's the same thing with pulmonary fibrosis. The more um, fibrotic it becomes, 
the more severe the fibrosis becomes, the harder it is for me, the radiologist, to figure out what the heck is going on. So, um, so, as, so a little pearl is if you have someone with fibrotic um, pulmonary fibrosis, it, it behooves you not to check the earliest CT possible. You want to check that earliest CT possible because very often the answer will be on that CT and not the actual CT that you're looking at. Now, kick it back to Greg here. Yeah, we'll pivot to um, uh, another large group that causes interstitial lung disease, and that's um, uh, the autoimmune diseases. And uh, as we talked about with IPF, there there are very common symptoms and signs. The difference might be certainly uh, in this group, there are associated features of um, uh, daytime arthralgias as well as uh, serologic abnormalities. And, and at least per guidelines, most patients with ILD should at a minimum undergo a screening uh, rheumatoid factor, CCP, and ANA. And that can be expanded depend on additional symptoms if, such as dry eyes and dry mouth might beget a SSA and SSB. But Suffice it to say, in individuals, they, they present very similar with shortness of breath, with cough, but they may have those additional features that raise concern. And the radiographic pattern may, might be slightly different, but um, again, uh, part of this is uh, not interpreting the CT in isolation, but in combination with the clinical features so that it provides the best interpretation of the abnormalities. And, um, and I think that that's an important aspect moving forward. Um, and I'll go to the next slide. Um, so we've expanded a, a little bit more, um, and certainly um, my rheumatologic colleagues say a positive blood test does not make a diagnosis of an underlying rheumatologic process. So this slide is meant to, to associate not only the serologic abnormalities, but the cognate symptoms that support that that blood test is a marker of a true underlying disease that's causing symptomatic abnormalities, such as arthritis or a rash or AM stiffness, and certainly an emerging group that's more common than we previously thought, those with polymyositis with abnormalities such as mechanicans or, or proximal muscle weakness and the associated other features, and discussed a little bit about the subtleties of Sjogren's with dry eyes and dry mouth. Well, and everyone has dry eyes and dry mouth in Colorado because it, uh, uh, it's so arid. But if you actually specifically ask people, and the telltale sign in my clinic is I can diagnose someone with Sjogren's because almost every single patient with Sjogren's walks in with a bottle of water, um, and within five minutes they're sipping, that's dry mouth. Um, and that really tells you that there is a significant functional change. And one of the really tough diagnoses is really Sjogren's. And so subtle skin thickening, um, probing for esophageal symptoms, not just reflux, but dysphagia, and really probing more about Raynaud's. And, and so it is, I think, uh, I have more respect for our rheumatologic colleagues the more I see patients who have rheumatologic disorders, because it is really a the conundrum of subtle abnormalities and, and, and the, the diligence with which they go through their histories and diagnose patients is, is quite informative. Um, and so I would argue that the more we learn, the more we realize we, we can count on some of the clinical aspects. Um, but uh, as Jonathan will say, that we need to think about the radiographic abnormalities in the context of those clinical symptoms. And so um, we'll move on to that here for the rheumatologic diseases. Yeah, so if you are worried about connective tissue disease, one of the most common patterns that we see on HRCT is this, nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis. And so the nice thing about nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis is that um, as opposed to, say, HP or even UIP, it's almost always basal predominant. So I have not seen a case of NSIP that is not basal predominant. If you read the literature, they say that there's a you know, case or two, but I have not seen a real-life case of NSIP, which is not basal predominant. And so even though people think of UIP as a basal predominant uh, pattern of pulmonary fibrosis, NSIP is even more basal predominant than UIP is, okay? What are the features that we're looking for here? We're looking for ground glass opacity, oftentimes with some reticulation, but the reticulation is usually, usually not as severe as in UIP. And then uh, oftentimes you get traction bronchiectasis, and sometimes the traction bronchiectasis can be very florid. Not in this case, in this example, not that florid. But one of the most specific findings that we see on HRCT for NSIP cases is that of subpleural sparing. So the, the, the most subpleural and the most peripheral portion of lungs are relatively spared. And we see that here, this rind of, of uh, lung, which essentially is not affected or barely affected 
by the ground glass opacity and reticulation. So that's one of the most specific findings that we see in NSIP. That really would be un unheard of in patients with UIP, and, and specifically UIP in the setting of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. UIP can also be seen in patients with connecticities. UIP and the most, the most common sub, uh, subtype of connecticities would be rheumatoid arthritis, giving that UIP pattern of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and so I just contrast that to this patient with nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis. Nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, it tends to be a prettier pattern, more symmetric, more ground glass opacity, and less coarse. It's like less hard on the eyes. As opposed to the UIP that we see in patients with connecticities, it's usually very coarse. And very often there's a lot of honeycombing. You know, we've actually, we've actually studied this, and we, we have the sign we call the exuberant honeycombing sign. And so we've shown that if you have a pulmonary fibrotic pattern that's UIP, where the, the, the predominant pattern is that of honeycombing. It's over 70% honeycombing in regard to the total amount of lung involved that almost always, well, I should say almost always, strongly correlated with connectivities as opposed to IPF, right? So that's very, very important. So this is a nice example, actually, I think of the exuberant honeycombing sign here. Maybe we'll move on to an autoimmune case in here with uh, systemic sclerosis ILD. Oftentimes, the, the most predominant symptom is that of Raynaud's, and it oftentimes is new onset rather than Raynaud's disease, which is, can be um, occur for 30 or 40 years and, and be common in young adulthood. Um, but that was the most prominent symptom in this patient, and, and fortunately, they had a good clinician who picked up on, on that but, and did some screening physiology uh, to complement some of the symptoms of breathlessness, which was difficult to clinically tease out. But if you pushed hard and asked them about their exercise tolerance, breathlessness was present. But we see physiologically there's a suggestion of what I'd say is moderate to severe restriction with moderate to severe gas exchange abnormalities or the suggestion of with the DLCO. So, this is a, a prominent um, physiologic abnormalities, and as we see, there's a positive ANA. When one to 640 speckle doesn't raise the alarm, but then we see with additional testing, the SCL70 is positive, and the TPO is also high, uh, strongly supporting uh, a diagnosis of systemic sclerosis or diffuse cutaneous sclerosis. Um, and with what is interesting is subtle radiographic abnormalities, Jonathan, if I were to Imagine what the CT would look like looking at the physiology. I would expect something uh, slightly more prominent than what I'm seeing here. Yeah, yeah, prob probably, but this is just one image, so who knows what's happening right. at the lung bases. Yeah, but, but this, this actually is a nice example. Another f sign of connective tissue disease that we see on HRCT. So, so we noted here that the anterior aspect of the upper lobes are more severely affected than other portions of the upper lobes. And so you know, we call this the anterior upper lobe sign. Again, we, we've shown that this is um, highly associated with connective tissue disease as opposed to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis when you have a UIP pattern of pulmonary, fib UIP pattern of pulmonary fibrosis. So, all right. So, let's, so this brings us to organizing pneumonia. So organizing pneumonia, another common subtype of interstitial lung disease that we're going to see. And someone make the argument that this is not fibrotic, but certainly it can be, it can be chronic, subacute to chronic, organized pneumonia. So I think it's fair to discuss this here. And so as opposed to the other findings that other types of disease that we saw, we've seen on HRCT, which are, we've, we mainly discussed the fibrotic uh, subtypes, uh, organized pneumonia really, we're talking about more non-fibrotic findings. So things like consolidation and ground glass opacity, and sometimes some nodule or lung disease. And so this is a nice example here where we see these bilateral areas of focal ground glass opacity, pretty nonspecific. Could this be aspiration? Could this be atypical infection? Could this be hemorrhage? Yeah, sure. This turns out to be organized pneumonia. And sometimes organized pneumonia just has this nonspecific appearance. Uh, on, in other situations, though, it has a more specific appearance. For example, here in, in image B here, we see these focal areas of ground glass opacity with these incomplete rims of consolidation. So another one here, another one here ground glass opacity with incomplete rims of consolidation. So that is known as the atoll sign, also known as the reverse halo sign. And I'll tell you, in the subacute to chronic setting, if you see that, almost always going to be organized pneumonia. If you look at the different, if you Google it, if you Google atoll sign or reverse halo sign, there's going to be different things that have been shown to cause it, so things like granulomatosis with polyangitis, you know, different types of infection. But, you know, those are, those are going to be usually more in the acute setting. In the subacute chronic setting, usually when you have this atoll sign, you should be thinking about organizing pneumonia. 
Also, we want you to be aware that organized pneumonia can be secondary. So it can be secondary to things like connect tissue disease, uh, secondary to uh, medications or even radiation, and so and, and even infection. So just because someone has an infection and has this pattern, it doesn't mean that the, this pattern is due to the infection by itself. It might actually be a reaction to the infection, and so really representing organized pneumonia. But again, I think I'm getting a little off track there. No, Jonathan, you think you bring up a good point because I think we were all trained about, um, you know, the old term boop. And when Epler had the, the Sentinel paper, I think it was in 1982, um, all organizing pneumonia was linked to that diagnosis of boop or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, which is now the term used. I think your point is organizing pneumonia, what you're calling on the um, radiographic images, is a form of lung injury that can be caused by a multitude of different um, insults. And so by aspiration, by autoimmune disease, but it can be seen in HP. It can be seen unto itself in that entity, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. But just like UIP is a pattern of abnormality, organizing pneumonia is a pattern of abnormality, and you feed that into the diagnostic strategy. So it's um, it, we should be cautious about using that term as a diagnosis, as more of a, a pattern. Eloquently stated. Um, well, great. So lastly, there's this big group of, as Jonathan said, we don't know what to do with them. They don't fit into any diagnostic category and they're quote unquote unclassifiable, but that is a diagnostic category now that it, it, we know that it's important. We know that they have fibrosis and we know that it impacts their um, survival. And so um, it should not scare us in terms of making the diagnosis because it has implications. And um, there are overlapping histologic radiographic patterns. Um, there are clinical features that really don't fit. And so I think what we will learn perhaps in five to 10 years is that we'll be able to classify this much more accurately as we learn more moving forward. Um, and this is probably what we spend most of our time in multidisciplinary discussions, trying to parse through what is it? And I think um, the concern that we've always had is um, if patients don't progress, okay, it's unclassifiable. Um, but when they begin to progress and they have progressive fibrosis, that's that's really what concerns us. And that's what's driven a lot of the discussion in our conferences that um, because their, their prognosis more approaches what we see in patients with IPF. And so um, the data has, has supported that long term. And I think more evidence in clinical trials supports the uh, concept that we should, this entity should be appropriately recognized and then appropriately treated moving forward. Um, but this is a diagnostic algorithm that certainly we have the ATS algorithm for patients with ILD and IPS. Um, it is important that we um, differentiate other possible alternative diagnoses. But as I suggested, when we exhaust that process, whether it's clinical, the radiographic pattern, then we can come up with a, a diagnosis of an unclassifiable interstitial lung disease based on the absence of consistent um, features that, that allow for an, uh, an alternative diagnosis, such as ITF or HP. Um, with those features, making that diagnosis, as I suggested, is important because of the prognostic um, um, differences, and we see them listed here at the bottom of the slide. So I would say it, it again supports the diagnosis and the importance of making a diagnosis, not just using the term interstitial lung disease, because if you have HP, we can perhaps focus on uh, abatement of the exposure in contrast to IPF. And then if you have RA, there are a multitude of other things that we need to address. So that's the importance of maybe introducing or reintroducing for many of you the importance of unclassifiable. And there, there, beyond this talk, there are many um, uh, excellent uh, articles that can further delineate the, the strategy. But I would say it is an evolving um, diagnostic entity, but an important one that we need to address moving forward. Um, and so I know I appreciate we're a little bit over time, but maybe we'll, we'll summarize um, importantly to say that um, we do believe that as we've suggested in the past, the presence of a fibrotic disease is important. But the issue and the importance of identifying if it's progressing over time has prognostic and therapeutic importance moving forward. Um, and we need to utilize the entire armamentarium, and whether it be HRCT, our clinical history, uh, physiology, exercise, gas exchange, and identify these individuals appropriately so we can care for them. Um, 
and and counsel them moving forward because the, their survival is likely to be impacted. Um, as Jonathan suggested, certainly the different patterns are, are very important, and it's it's encouraging to see the emphasis on HRCT because um, the science is is rapidly evolving, as, as Dr. Chung alluded to. Um, there are multiple algorithms that are, are trying to be validated to assess quantification that will further advance our understanding of progression, as well as artificial intelligence or not, uh, language learning that will guide us moving forward. And being a clinician, I, I continue to think talking to the patient is important in integrating those data moving forward. Um, and so I'd like to thank you. I think this is an important topic. I know many of us will have um, an opportunity, and hopefully we can get together at the next ATS in person, um, if not uh, the following year. But um, there's additional information. There's a wonderful website, um, uh, www.ipfradiologyrounds.com, as well as the Insight, Insight, Insights ILD website that provide further information. And so um, I'd like to thank Dr. Chung for his um, uh, time and talking to us today. Always wonderful to see him again, whether it's remote or in person. Um, and thank you for your attention and uh, wish you the best. Please be safe, be well, and um, hopefully we can move past the pandemic as fast as possible. So thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you have any last minute words to, other than goodbye. No, it was, it was <laughs> Oh, goodbye. It was, a, it was a pleasure. Always so fun. So I hope you guys learned something from this uh, and enjoyed the talk. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Have a great night.